He hane washte mikirapi. And peto kinle shante washte. Patrice Kunish and Mochle Yapie. Good day, all my relatives. I greet you with a good heart. My name is Patrice Kunish, and I'm just so very, very happy to be here with you today. My sincere appreciation to Valerie for this wonderful opportunity to, to share some of our work and some of our deep thinking around these issues. I have to start off by saying that all of the perspectives and opinions that I'm sharing with you today are, are those of mine alone and not necessarily those of the Minneapolis Fed or the Federal Reserve System. I guess I should also start with a comment that while we are here for a constructive uh, conversation engagement around race, Native American people and Native tribal nations are not racial uh, designations. And hopefully through the conversation today, we'll be able to distinguish and, and, and come away with that uh, it's a political relationship that Native peoples have, Native tribal nations have with the federal government. And that is a particularly important point as we look at some of the most serious legal issues facing Indian country, Indian child welfare. So with that, um, <clears throat> I also thought I should mention that November has been designated as Native American Heritage Month since 1990. And that's when George H. Bush signed the first proclamation uh, designating it formally as a national um, <clears throat> as, as, as a national endeavor. But I've recently learned that a uh, presidential proclamation now declares November 2019 as National American History and Founders Month with no reference to indigenous peoples. The proclamation encourages us to study our country's founding documents and explore our unique history. So nevertheless, it's appropriate, I think, that we examine the history of first Americans, as Valerie shared with us, our Native Americans, and appreciate the distinctive role in shaping, I think, the moral character of this country. So I think we're all good? OK. All right. I've got the. Um, this is what I'd like to share with you today. First of all, just an overview of the Center for Indian Country Development. What is it? What does it do? How does it fit into the, the general scheme of things at the Federal Reserve? Then I'd like to take you through some historical uh, uh, events that have formed and shaped what we see as current economics in Indian Country. And then I, I, I want to take us through a, another conversation showing you some of the real lived experiences that give me hope for resurgence of our Native American peoples. Uh, generally, the mission of the center is to support the prosperity of Native nations through actionable research and really meaningful community collaboration. So let me just deconstruct that for a minute. Prosperity. We often do not think of the word prosperity in conjunction with Native nations. We think of Native nations oftentimes as being poor or deprived, a lot of despair and trauma. And while that is true, there's enormous amount of growth and progress. And that's where I think we want to really focus the research of the center in looking for those opportunities to really extend and advance that prosperity. Native nations, oftentimes, you know, we talk about tribes. And, and in, the, in the general discourse of the United States, we hear about tribalism. And uh, I just want to make the distinguishing uh, uh, connection here that tribalism used in that way, in, in, the, in the current popular way, is really about division and divisiveness. And when we think about native tribes, we think about community and stewardship and, and uh, supporting each other. So I, I just want to, to you to think about that and, and nations. Nations is the part that defines the tribe's authority as sovereigns. 
They are political entities predating the US Constitution. They are sovereign governments with the authority to make laws and be ruled by them. So when I say native nations, I'm really expressing that broader political relationship. And further, the relationship between uh, citizens of the tribe also is a political relationship. And that's the distinguishing point between a race-based conversation and what we see as a political legal relationship. And finally, uh, community collaboration. This has to be based in the community. We have to really appreciate the lived experience and not just extrapolate on a very theoretical, very theoretical high level. We really want to get into the nitty gritty. So that's our mission. And, um, and this is our development thesis. It really is about supporting the economic development of Indian country. And that includes uh, creating more capital or bringing more capital to Indian country and making efficient use of existing capital. It's uh, based on a land-based economy. We often hear economists talk in terms of uh, place-based and people-based. In Indian country, it's both because it is a geographical area. And the people in those geographical territories are, are absolutely um, uh, worthy of further inquiry. I say the built economy because we are absent so many types of infrastructure from banking and financial services, we're either unbanked or underbanked, to just not having schools and grocery stores, things that most typical communities have that support that nourishing and, and thriving community. And then, of course, human capital. And, and that's jobs, of course, but also creating pipelines from early childhood development with cultural practices, language, and, and, and culture. So maybe I should stop here a minute and say, how did the Federal Reserve, or explain how the Federal Reserve got in the business of Indian country? Uh, the center was established four years ago, four and a half years ago, and I was brought in um, to be the first director to really blow life into this thing we call the center, using the tools of research and collaboration. I was here in Washington, D.C. at the time. I was an appointee, a political appointee, at the Department of Agriculture, heading up the uh, Rural Development Agency. And before that, I was the Solicitor for Indian Affairs at the Department of the Interior. So I really got a good lay of the land in terms of how Washington worked, the different agencies, and the amazing power of, of federal investments in community. And the Federal Reserve Bank, um, of course, its main goals are monetary policy, the focus on making sure we have uh, low inflation and full employment. And so in that sphere of full employment and low inflation, we want to look at anything that's dragging or holding back the economy. And in the Ninth District, which represents um, um, North Dakota, South Dakota, Montana, uh, Minnesota, parts of Wisconsin and Michigan, uh, the American Indian tribal nations make up a very large land base and a very significant population as well. So our community development team really had taken a close look and started really working uh, with tribes in the 9th District around uh, private economy, you know, Secure Transactions Act, and, 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 and supporting entrepreneurship. So the center was created out of this a larger um, his uh, legacy work of taking a closer look at Indian country. But we're on a national level, and we want to take a look at Indian country writ large. So when I say Indian country, it's really the, the entire uh, United States. And so when we think about what else we need to bring capital to Indian country, we also need to recognize, as I said earlier, that tribes are self-governing nations, sovereignty. And so how do we support in the best way 
through research, through engagement, uh, a full commitment to, to sovereign self-governance. And how do we support that with evidence to help them make good decisions, as well as those other policymakers, be it state or local or obviously federal policymakers, make good decisions? And we need to support that with strong leadership. And oftentimes we think of leadership as the, our, our elected leaders. And what we find in Indian country is that there are layers and layers of leaders. And these are people from the community, our grandmothers and our grandfathers. They're the housing director or the director of, of child protective services, our tribal court judges. These are our real leaders. So I thought, uh, given this is a Native American Heritage Month, I might share with you a little bit about um, my history and showing perhaps how the economics of Indian countries intertwined with all of this history. So uh, my heritage goes back to the Shushuste, who is lame deer, and his uh, time was at a transformational period in the United States. It was the end or the end of Indian peoples as they knew it, roaming and living off the land in their Aboriginal homelands. So he died in 1877 fighting for the right to remain unrestricted and untethered and unsupervised supervised by the federal government. He was a principal leader of his, of, his, of his tribe, and he opposed the treaties of 1851 and 1868. These are the treaties of Fort Laramie that required the Great Sioux Nation to give up much, much of its lands. And here's another word, reservation. Reservation is really the rights of the tribes to retain lands from their original homelands. They reserve the lands for themselves. Oftentimes people have a misconception about what a reservation is, and it certainly is a place. But it was a place that through the land sessions, Native peoples uh, were able to, to uh, retain. So Lame Deer fought the treaties of Fort Laramie that required the Lakota people to cede much of their territory. He was present at the 1876 Battle of the Greasy Grass, also known as the Battle of, Little Big, of the Little Bighorn, where the combined forces and allied forces dealt an overwhelming defeat to the United States military forces. Well, that set off a whole nother chain of history and the subjugation and trauma of, of Native peoples. He was killed in 1877 when his village was attacked by soldiers under the command of Colonel Nelson Miles, about one mile southwest of the town that's now named for him, Lame Deer, Montana. So he married Skuyapi, which means to sweeten, and they had a son named Shunhapi, which means very sugary. And I was at a, a, a natural food store the other day, and I saw uh, honey and molasses, and they're all chunhapi, to sweeten. It's also a term of endearment. My grandfather called my mother chunhapi, the sweet little one. So we have seven, eight generations now of our family descending from lame deer, and um, still a very strong tie to land and people and to our history. And so when I mention the Great Sioux Nation, if you can see, the, the, the territory in that um, beige or yellow color was the vastness of the Great Sioux Nation, all the way to uh, mid-Montana and Wyoming, down through Colorado and Kansas, over through Iowa and Wisconsin. And the, the darker swatches are, are now the smaller reservations. So here we have uh, the Standing Rock Reservation, which is uh, my mother's tribe. Cheyenne River, we've got Rosebud and Pine Ridge, Sisseton, Wapiton. We have the smaller reservations, and you can see that progressively the, uh, um, the reservations got smaller and smaller and smaller. <clears throat> 
This map is really uh, amazing to see uh, just the, the vast territory that we once occupied, that once gave us food and subsistence. This is another uh, one of my, my relatives. Her name is Josephine Gates Kelly. She was an amazing woman in so many different ways. She also was a, a part of history in the making. She's a great aunt. She was born and raised at the Standing Rock Reservation, and she attended the Carlisle Indian Boarding School in Pennsylvania, where she met my uncle. And both of them returned to the reservation, where she became the first and only woman chief of the Standing Rock Sioux Tribe. She uh, was a tenacious fighter for her people, especially those living on the reservation. In 1940, Aunt Josephine hitchhiked to Washington, D.C. because she wanted to meet with President Roosevelt to tell him personally about the conditions on the reservation. And she thought she could convince him to pay attention to the plight of the reservation Indians, to add some uh, uh, um, um, support, financial support, to lessen the burdens and, and, and trials and tribulations. She also fought against the Indian Reorganization Act, which forced Native nations to redefine how they govern themselves. And the federal government uh, created a constitution that said, OK, all tribes, you will now have to form governments along the framework of this cookie cutter constitution. Well, she never made, um, she never met President Roosevelt, but she did meet Eleanor Roosevelt a couple of times. And Eleanor was just uh, uh, um, taken with her strength, her courage, and with her story. And while no specific aid came back to Standing Rock through that visit, Eleanor gave her money to take a train back to, uh, to South Dakota rather than having to hitchhike back. But she's an amazing uh, uh, historical figure, and she recognized the value of culture and community and, and families. And so I often take um, uh, look back to her for strength and courage in and of itself. Can I just go back to the past? Yes. So I, I'm just curious, like the, the beige area that's identified as the territory, Right, right. So Valerie asks, how did we define the territory of the Great Sioux Nation? And, and these are tribes that were both nomadic as well as uh, they, had, they had permanent places, permanent villages as well. And when we talk about the Great Sioux Nation, we have, uh, the La, we have the Lakota, Dakota, and Nakota, and then we have many, many bands, the Hunkpapa, the Ogallala, the Yanktene, the Sinkangu. And so these different bands occupied the different territory, and they knew just sort of where each other's uh, place boundaries, and there weren't boundaries per se, but they knew really based upon hunting and fishing and gathering who had a principal or primary um, uh, um, sort of take on that land. And there were skirmishes, to be sure, over scarce resources. The introduction of the horse and the bison, I'm going to be telling you about the bison. Certainly there was competition. There was also vast trade networks, and, and, I'll, and I'll share with you about that. But for the most part, they respected this territory. So where, uh, where the tribal nations ended up on these reservations was really uh, a significant part of their own particular history. Um, but this can be replicated in the Southwest and the Northwest as we saw Aboriginal tribal nations really expanding the entire nation. That's a good question. So there's Josephine, and she's my, my, ins my inspiration. And so this is, this is uh, South Dakota, I mean Fort Yates, uh, South Dakota. It's the headquarters of the Standing Rock Sioux Tribe, and you may have heard last several years about the No Dapple uh, protests out at Standing Rock. 
north of Fort Yates, uh, near Cannonball, where my family live. It's a, it's a thriving community, but still desperately needing to get some real economic lift. My grandfather was born on the Fort Berthold Reservation of the Mandan, Hidatsa, and Arikara, and then grew up on Standing Rock. And both of those moves were because their homes were taken taken for dams, taken for reclamation projects. So it's also a history of displacement. So when I say the Indian country spans the entire country, here's a map of the entire United States. And I do want to point out both Alaska and Hawaii. Alaska has a, a very unique law applying to Alaskan Natives, the Alaskan Native Settlement Claims Act. And while they do not have reservations but for one, they do have a network of over 200 Alaskan Native villages that have extensive uh, uh, role and responsibility for the well-being of, of Alaskan Native people. Native Hawaiians are not federally recognized per se, but we include them and embrace them in the term indigenous peoples, Native Americans. So the rest of the country, uh, you can see the big, large land-based reservations in the West. And obviously that's a, that's a function of history. You know, the first encounters on the very East uh, decimated Native peoples through diseases and, and, and through um, land occupation. And uh, I just want to point out the blue area, as you see down there in Oklahoma, right above Texas. Oklahoma is the original Indian territory, and that's where the federal government wanted to move all Native Americans in the, wheat, in the East. They wanted to move them to Indian territory, Oklahoma. The interesting thing is that while the green uh, regions designate trust lands or res federal trust lands that are encompassed by the reservations, we have very, very little trust lands in Oklahoma. We consider them Indian country, and they are a tribally, um, they're a statistical area, a tribal statistical area. Um, but that's the difference that we see uh, with Oklahoma. And they do present differently because of that history. Another thing I want to, you can't discern this, but within the Navajo Nation, which spans the four corners, we have the Hopi Reservation. So we have nations within nations. And let me just point that out. Here is uh, the enormous Navajo Reservation with over 350,000 citizens and then the Hopi nation within that territory. And this spans all of Oklahoma. You can see that uh, it's still very uh, highly populated, um, but the land status is different. OK, so let's just, yes, sir. Can you go back to the map? Yes. Uh, in the southeast. Very good. So this is purple, and, and purple would represent state-recognized tribes. So for example, in North Carolina, we have a very large population uh, of, Alumbi, of Alumbi people. And so uh, federal, uh, federal, does, uh, federal recognition is a political relationship with the federal government. State recognition is a, a, a political relationship with the state. Very good question. Good eyes. So uh, who are we? Who are we? Um, oftentimes, I have to say this right off, we're an invisible nation. We call ourselves an asterisk nation because we do not appear in many of the statistics about race, ethnicity, and, and, and other economic social indicators. It, we might be an asterisk at the bottom of the graph, or we're in this other category. So who are we? Let's bring this out. We are Alaskan, we are American Indian, Alaskan Native uh, through the US Census. Uh, we're 5.2 million strong and a very rapidly growing population. 
About 60% of American Indians and Alaska Native live on or near the reservation. And we'll talk a little bit about what are the forces that are driving Native people off the reservation. So there's a very strong connection to the homelands. There's also a very strong presence of Native people in urban areas. And there's a lot of mobility back and forth, like from Minneapolis or Duluth uh, to the tribal nations. We're also a very young population. About a third are less than 18 years. And that compares to about 25% of the US population. And then the socioeconomic indicators, and, and Valerie did a really wonderful uh, article about the socioeconomic indicators here at EPI. There is definitely real, persistent, deep poverty. But we're also seeing some real uh, per capita and household income growth. So we're seeing a, a, a very strong emergence of um, a, a native middle class. So let's get into the economics of Indian country. As I mentioned, uh, native people had a very, very extensive network for trade and commerce. And here's a map that depicts uh, Native American trade routes. And you can see that from the, the Midwest all the way to the West, and I would say and argue that it's extensive to the East as well, we were trading, bartering, selling, exchanging, through potlatch and, and, and other in, uh, engagements, a really strong network of, of, of goods. And those could be goods like furs and, and, and pelts, but they could also be um, things like um, arrows and, uh, and other tools and instruments. These social networks also created cohesiveness amongst the people and an exchange of, 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 of um, a people from one community to a next through adoption, through marriage, um, and so forth. So you can see that uh, these extensive trade routes really brought Indian people closer and closer. Here's a Lakota woman. Uh, I believe she's uh, from Rosebud. And you can see in her regalia that she is wearing uh, uh, dentalium shells. And these are tiny little shells that you only find in the Pacific Northwest. So this shows to me evidence of trade and commerce and exchange. And by the way, she must have been a very wealthy, from a very wealthy family, as you see, not just in her uh, head braids, but her, her chest mantle as well. Subsistence. When we talk about the Great Sioux Nation, the territory really was about subsistence. Where did we go for food? And for the, uh, for, the, for, the, for the Lakota people, we depended on, and not just the Dakota or the Lakota, it was really all the way from Canada through, um, through New Mexico, depended on the North American bison. Over 12,000 years of evidence show that indigenous peoples had a very intense relationship uh, with the North American bison that also supported an innovative use and efficient use of the North American bison for everything related to their, uh, to their subsistence. Plains tribes and their trading partners, as we showed earlier, completely consumed and utilized the bison as a food staple, for tools, for clothing, for shelter. It provided them everything. And when buffalo meat was combined with berries and wild rice and other, this was called pemmican. This was the food stuff that carried them through the long, hard winters. It was like a superfood. And now we have the, the Lower Brule uh, tribe in South Dakota creating uh, tonka bars, trying to replicate. Tonka means big. And tonka bars are sort of the, 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 uh, the modern iteration of that pemmican that comes from this amazing food staple. We had maps, you know, we, we tried to figure out where to go, how to go, where's the migration, 
Where's the best hunting grounds? Where do we get the, the corn, the berries, the, 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 uh, the grains? This is the Black Goose map of the Kiowa, Comanche, and Apache reservations around the turn of the century, 1889 to 1895. And the thing that I love about the Black Goose map is that it's totally a native perspective. This is not Eurocentric whatsoever. It's about where families live. It's about where the buffalo are. It's about subsistence. You see almost uh, nothing about the non-Indian institutions. It demonstrates a very historical, environmental, agricultural, and cultural knowledge about the land. And this was used to share uh, uh, with others of where to go and when to meet. I mean, it really was both seasonal, intercultural, and so forth. We also had our own currency. And those of you from the East may know that this is a wampum belt of shells, quahog shells from uh, the, the Wampanoag tribe. This was very, very, very valuable. And it was very difficult to make. So the value came in from the handicraft of, of the wampum. And it was an exchange. I mean, we don't think of it necessarily as currency like dollars and, and, and quarters, but it was a very significant type of currency. It's still used today, informally. And of course, we had our legal systems. This is a, a longhouse of the Iroquois Confederacy. And uh, I had mentioned about the Reorganization Act earlier that my Aunt Josephine protested this cookie cutter constitution, which was foreign, completely foreign to, to the Indian tribes. Uh, most commonly, there would be a council. And the council would, would talk through the issues. And it was representative of all the families in the community. And consensus was made, and certainly consensus through compromise. So the new form of government was really hierarchical rather than distributive. And so that's something that, uh, that I think we lost when we became formalized into reservations and these uh, IRA constitutions. But if you want to understand poverty and inequality in Indian country, you really need to understand native land loss. And we talked a little bit about that earlier, um, but it's pretty phenomenal. So I mentioned the bison, right, the North American bison. As many as 30 million North American bison existed pre-contact. In the late 19th century, the North American bison was brought to near extinction in just over a few years, less than a decade. And uh, the center research economist Donna Fair has taken, ex undertaken extensive research to examine the impact of this near extinction of the North American bison on the indigenous economies and the policies that followed. And from her research, she finds that this near extinction, this rapid slaughter of the North American bison was arguably the largest economic shock in North America history. The largest, one of the largest economic shocks in recorded North American history. She has a really fantastic working paper on it, published on the CICD webpage, The Slaughter of the Bison and Reversal of Fortunes on the Great Plains. This uh, chart shows uh, the, you know, how, how rapid it was. I mean, can you see between the years 1870 and 1880? This is, this is uh, the, the slaughter count, right? You can see that it was um, a, an unbelievable uh, bloodbath of the bison. And here is a photo depicting a, a mountain of, of the bison skulls. And, 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 and sort of the, I, I think the, the guy standing on top, you know, it's sort of like, we conquered this, we got this, the land is ours now. And it was so, uh, so rapid and, and so shocking. Uh, and Donna wanted to see what were these impacts of before and after. And what she found is that Native people in the Great Plains who were bison dependent, 
were strongest. They were the tallest, they were the strongest, and they were long-lived. Decades uh, later, generations later, these same people are some of the shortest, the shortest mortality, and some of the, the greatest health disparities. Uh, it's just, as you can see, the reversal of fortune, not just in terms of, of the ability to live off the land, but the physical impacts are really demonstrable. Donna contends that federal Indian policy that limited the out-migration from reservations and restricted employment opportunities to crop-based agriculture hampered the ability of bison-reliant societies to adjust in the long run, generating lasting regional disparities associated with other indicators of social dislocation. So again, the history and our heritage is just one dislocation and displacement after the other. Yes. So what was the motivation of the bison? Yes, it was to clear land. Why did they want to clear the bison? Well, at that time, of course, we had manifest destiny. We had the, the, the entitlement of, of the settlers, the white settlers, to this land. And it was right after the Civil War, and the United States really needed to uh, increase and expand industry, industrialization, the economy. So they opened up the land. Um, and to open up the land to railroads and settlers, they needed to clear it. And first they needed to clear it of native peoples, and then they needed to clear it of other obstacles, the bison. And that is a perfect segue into the land loss. And you've heard about the land rush, and you've heard about the Lewis and Clark Trail, and you know how the West starts in St. Louis. Well, Again, it's, it's really uh, a, a different story. You know, I, I guess all of this is, is a different story. The federal government, and this was a collective effort of the executive and the legislative and certainly the judicial branches, set out to acquire the most valuable lands in Indian country. Again, breaking up reservations even into smaller pieces, destroying families and these cultural connections. And one of the main policies to do this, uh, to break up the Indian reservations, to get more land, was what we call the General Allotment Act, or the Dawes Act of 1887, which decreed that Indian land was to be further divided into smaller plots and then allocated to individual Native people. My grandfather has an original allotment on the South Dakota side of the Standing Rock Reservation. We still have those lands. They are vital to who we are and where we come from. These two uh, banners or advertisements were uh, both in 1879 and 1911. That gives you a perspective of the land-hungry uh, federal government. Land for sale, gold grand rush that led to a gold rush in California. I was just out in San Diego at the Social Science Association and I was taking a walk down by the marina and I saw uh, a ship and on the ship it said 250 years. Uh, California began 250 years ago with the beginning of the gold rush. I'm thinking, wait a minute, wait a minute, Native people were here. California just didn't start, Native people were here. But they were very proud of pinpointing uh, the birth of, of, of California. And the Dawes Act was a land-eating machine. It's all it did was uh, gobble up much, much more land for the... Uh, um, land-hungry government, the railroads, and so forth. So within 50 years, again, another tremendous shock to Native people, the, the, the land base. Uh, first we had original lands, right? Then we had reservation lands, and now we have allotments. And through allotments, the land shrank again from 138 million acres in 1887 to a mere 48 million in 1934. I mean, it was a phenomenon that 
was just crazy bizarre. And this was a, lands were acquired through coerced land sales, through foreclosures, through delinquent uh, tax payments, taking the so-called surplus lands after the lands were allotted, and often through violence. And we were talking a little bit earlier about the violence we saw in Oklahoma once oil and gas was discovered there. So this really depicts that native lands were, were, were targeted from the very, very beginning. And overall, the history of American Indians really has been one of poverty and substantial underdevelopment. Today, the native lands comprise about 60 million acres, I think more than 60 million acres. We don't have uh, an exact um, number of acres of trust lands. These are lands that are held by the federal government for the use and benefit of native people. We say these are our lands, but the legal title to which is held by the federal government and that's an important issue because while we have land and we have sovereignty over the land, we do not have control over the complex processes that define development and opportunities. And I'll get into that a little bit more. Another, another economic phenomena is the re-education of Native people. And I mentioned earlier that my aunt Josephine and uncle Kali attended the Indian boarding school at Carlisle. And here's a picture of, of, of a couple of, of three Native kids, wounded yellow robe, handing, Henry Standing Bear, and timber yellow robe. This was before they attended Carlisle, and there's the after. And it was part of this era of reservations and, and land acquisition that the federal policy turned again. And they said, we have to erase the Indianness out of Native people. And in fact, Henry Pratt, who started the Carlisle boarding school, said, kill the Indians, save the man. So Native people would be taken thousands of miles from their homeland, sometimes as young as three or four years old. They'd be put into a boarding school and immediately stripped of all of their Native clothing. Some of this would be very sacred or spiritual um, pieces as well. Those would be burned. Their hair would be cut all the way down to their scalp, and then sometimes they would have cuts in their scalp and kerosene would be poured over because the belief is that they were dirty and they were carrying nits and lice. And then they were given hard leather shoes and uniforms and they were forbidden to speak their language. If they spoke Indian, they would be punished severely. My uncle Colvin escaped several times from Indians, the, from Carlisle boarding school. He hated it there, just absolutely hated it there. And Carlisle actually had posses, men with guns on horses to go after the escaped Indians, bringing them back and they were severely punished. And I think he escaped four times, and the fourth time he managed never to be found and come back, or be brought back. He ended up and found his way back to the reservation, somewhat crippled and a broken man, but he knew he wasn't going to stand, um, uh, stand there. So this happened to thousands upon thousands upon thousands of Native kids. And this is where we find a lot of the worst historical trauma, this intergenerational uh, carrying of this, this tra very traumatic uh, experience. Another thing I should mention about the boarding school is that for the first time, it brought, I mean, aside from the, the social connections and the, the social networks, it forced Native peoples to be together in the same place. And that's where we start to see the emergence of a pan-Indian movement. And that will be important as we see later on. But the boarding school era did not stop until the 70s. So this is the early days. It did not stop. 
It's one of the most damaging policies of the federal government. And Donna Fair again has uh, taken a look at the institutions of education uh, from a Canadian First Nations perspective. And she finds, uh, not surprisingly, that uh, Native peoples who survived boarding school, we call it surviving boarding school, actually had uh, uh, um, uh, stronger, uh, um, they were healthy because they were fed, and oftentimes mothers would give their children up uh, because they were starving and they wanted their children to be fed. Um, but they had an ability to move through two worlds because they knew and understood English. They also had the Indian way about them. Often this created a lot of confusion. Who am I? Am I an Indian person or am I a white person? How do I move in and out on these intersections of our society? So Donna's, suggests, Donna's findings suggest that the health interventions actually did have significant impacts on adult health. And those results suggest um, significant increases in height and body weight. Um, and then, of course, the substantial changes in their diet made them a lot more resilient to, to, to health problems. Yes, sir. Yes. When they were, when the bison were plentiful, they mm -hmm. were tall and strong. Mm -hmm. and it was after deprivation when the schools Then the schools opened, and it did provide a consistent food source. And when we have consistent food source, we can become stronger, at least uh, physically stronger. Right, but mentally, socially, emotionally, there's still there's still a huge scar. So for us to realize full self-determination and property rights and land reform, it has to be done by the people themselves. It can't be done uh, externally by the federal government. It can't be done by um, missionaries and, and charitable organizations. It has to be done within the community. And these community values that promote family relationships and support individual interests can uh, can can coexist concurrently to advance, I think, the betterment of our of our tribal nations. So I mentioned about the land situation, right? I mentioned from the, the Aboriginal territories to the much smaller reservations to the allotted lands. This graph depicts what happens when we see allotted lands being devised from one generation to another. So these are now individual lands that are still restricted. They can't be sold or encumbered without the approval of the federal government. But let's take the original allottee, and let's say he has 100 or she has 100 acres. And she devises it or passes it is inherited by uh, three members of, of, of her family. So each of those three siblings would acquire a one-third interest. And then they each have three. And so you can see each way along until the fifth generation, that person would have a one 243rd of the original. And when I say we still have our allotted lands in South Dakota, I say that with just relief and pride because I have 13 brothers and sisters. <laughs> and you can imagine that if, um, and my grandfather had five children, so we actually have 1 13th of 1 5th of the original allotment. But we were able to preserve that in my niece, who's a member of the Standing Rock, citizen of the Standing Rock Sioux Tribe, so she will have that forever. Yes, that's a fantastic question. Is it heirs' property, or is it some other way that property is devised through a formal arrangement? My mother gift deeded her interest to her granddaughter. 
And that's something we promote because it's easy, very uh, readily done. You don't need lawyers. It's not complicated. Uh, you're gifting your interest. And, um, and that's the most efficient way to do it. But when the federal government established allotments, they did not consider the, uh, the inheritance factor. So, of course, you can imagine in the late uh, 1800s, early 1900s, Native peoples weren't even considered citizens of the United States. We did not gain citizenship until 1924. Um, so no legal documents really were uh, introduced. It was, it, it was a mess. It was complete and utter mess. And they did not realize the impact of a fractionation until um, the 1940s, the 19, 1934, the federal government stopped allotment and we're trying to regain those particular interests, but it's, it's, it's like bunnies reproducing. You cannot stop this. There's just, we're trying to introduce formal legal, uh, like, like a will, um, like a gift deed, um, but it's very, very challenging. And so I think this represents one of the most um, serious challenges to land use. Um, Let's take a look at this. This is, a, is um, this is a chart of the number of HUD loans. HUD is, uh, of course, the Housing and Urban Development has an Office of Native American Programs, and they have a program called the HUD 184 Loan Guarantee. And that program is ostensibly synonymous with home ownership. And as you can see in 1994, the 184 program was established and it was intended to help native people build homes on the reservations. That's all it was intended to do. And billions of dollars of loan authority were authorized to help native people build their own homes. And you can see for the first 20 years, the program was flat. The red represents fee land. Fee land is land property that you and I, you know, in the cities own with no encumbrance or restriction on, on selling it or encumbering it with a mortgage. The black la line is trust lands. Those are the Indian lands that the federal government has title to. And the yellow is the allotted lands I was just mentioning. So for the first years, there was no uptake of this program at all. And we're wondering, well, why would that be? Here we have billions of dollars. Why can't we get uh, lending on trust lands? And we find that it's because of these complex bureaucratic processes, that everything has to go through the Bureau of Indian Affairs, and there's multiple, multiple levels of review, and it has to go through the trust office, and the realty office, and the probate office. Sometimes it'll take five years to get a leasehold mortgage on trust land. So in 2004, Congress said, okay, We've got to do something about this. We're going to open up the program to fee lands. These are lands designated anywhere and particularly designated off the reservation. Well, lending sword, as you can see, I mean, just a phenomenal um, uh, um, buy on into this program. So 93% of those HUD loans are now on fee lands, now off the reservation, depriving that economic and community development on the land. So it has this perverse incentive to encourage investment and development off the reservation. We just high, uh, added a couple years on, and we see a big dip at the tail end, as you can see, of, of lending on um, general lending. And we're finding that banks have really retreated from Indian country, and they've retreated from rural uh, as, as well. But we're not seeing as many banks participating in the program. And that's a very big concern to us, because we need banks to participate. We need. Uh, a surgeon. And we see a little bit of an uptick on the bottom. We like to think that it's the center really calling this out and trying to get some, some good action. But here is a program designed for home ownership in Indian country, and it's bypassing the reservation.
On the flip side, I think this shows something really positive. And that is that there's a demand for home ownership, there's a capacity for own home ownership. And when we see the, the growth in real ca uh, income, as well as improvement in credit scores, we know that Native people are ready and waiting for home ownership to build assets, to create this, this prosperity. This is something that's just come out recently, and I presented this a few weeks ago before the US Senate Committee on Indian Affairs. We wanted to know who's lending, where they're lending, who's not lending, and why not. That came from this, you know, that downtick, who's not lending. So the, uh, what we see over here is the proportion of, um, of mortgage loans that are higher price for Native American borrowers. And we looked at this on the reservation and neighboring census tracts. So the blue line at the top represents American Indians and Alaskan Natives on reservation lands. These are census tracts that overlay the reservation. The green is nearby, you know, maybe not on the reservation, but close by. The, the black is non-Native uh, non people on reservation tracks. That's important to know. And the red is non-Native on nearby. And what this is telling us is that Native Americans living on reservations who want to buy homes are significantly more likely to have higher priced mortgages. And those mortgage rates are have an average of nearly two percentage points higher than for non-Native peoples outside the reservation. And this means that a Native borrower who's lucky enough to get a mortgage on a home for about $140,000 will pay as much as $107,000 more over the course of a 30-year mortgage than a non-Native American purchasing that home. And I want you to take a look at the black line. These are non-Indians on reservation tracks, okay? This, you're comparing this and that. Same place, and we have these, these enormous disparities. So the findings also are coming out that about 30, yes ma'am. Right. Now that's not, a, that, that's a good question, all good questions. Why or how are non-natives on reservations? Well, remember when I said they allotted the reservations and after the parcels were allotted to all the citizens, there was this so-called surplus land that was open for settlement. So non-Indians came pouring onto the reservations and actually got some of the best land for, for agriculture ranching purposes. So now we have um, sort of a crazy quilt pattern of land, uh, land, land tenure on the reservation, and which makes it really crazy for development and jurisdiction purposes. So allotted lands are restricted, like trust lands. And, um, and even these teeny tiny parcels, like 1 10,728, those are restricted lands and it requires an official action. Some of these uh, smallest parcels you know, can be as cheated back to the tribe, but managing that is enormously expensive. Going back to these findings, we, we find that 30% of the loans made to Alaska Natives and um, American Indians on these reservation properties, about 30% are uh, related to manufactured housing. And of those uh, manufactured housings, those rates tend to be the highest rates of all. I mean, phenomenally more expensive. 
And so looking behind that, we find, okay, so you can't get a, a, a land mortgage, you know, a land-based mortgage. We get a leasehold mortgage, which requires a lot of Bureau of Indian Affairs involvement. Let's get a manufactured home that looks like personal property, right? And so a personal property loan has these phenomenally high interest rates. And we're seeing, I think, that play out in this. Yes, sir. Yes, 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 yeah. We, uh, the, the question is, uh, how do tribal courts factor into this? How do tribal legal systems factor in? To have a mortgage system on the reservation, you have to have a foreclosure and eviction law. And many of these mortgages are backed up by um, uh, Fannie Mae and, and Ginnie Mae and Freddie Mac. And, and, and they have to conform to a certain standard. You have to have an MOU with the, with the, with the tribal nation. And, uh, and, and the other question, though, that you mentioned is about Secure Transaction Act. And we really have looked at closely at tribes with Secure Transaction Act. You have to have one in place to, to have a lending system. Whether tribes do better with, uh, with uh, do tribal economies do better with Secure Transaction Act, we don't know that for sure. Because very few tribes actually have uh, an, an active or operating secure transaction system. We don't have a really good filing system is really what it comes down to where, where uh, banks and lenders can actually look and see if there's any encumbrances on the land. But I, I want to mention uh, a new finding uh, is that about 60% of native borrowers are really impacted by these higher price loans. So being a native person in so many respects is a risk factor in and of itself. So I wanted to also share with you, though, the impacts of um, Indian country economics from an economic mobility perspective. Uh, we know that every parent would like their child to have a better life than they did, right? And better often includes this hope that their children are better off financially. Financially meaning that there's more security and stability. And in economic terms, this is called intergenerational mobility, that what I have built in terms of my wealth, I can pass on to my children. So I really wanted to take a look at what does opportunity look like for Native kids? And where is opportunity lacking? And what can we do for that? So again, our research economist, Donna Fair, examined Raj, Raj Chetty's Opportunity Atlas to really see what does Indian country look like. And we find a very different landscape for Indian country. Um, we call this the slippery staircase that, uh, for those of you, I'm not an economist, I'm a lawyer, so those of you who are economists could interpret this you know, very, very well. Um, the blue is the American Indian, Alaska Native, black is red, Hispanics are green, and whites are yellow, sorry. And you can see that the, uh, the likelihood of ending up on the bottom for a Native American, we're at the top of that. And uh, look, at the, look at the other side, the, uh, the opportunity for, for Native American people to actually rise up and, and end up on, on the top, not very likely. So they're the, the, the complete opposite. So Donna Fair found three distinct patterns in looking at the, uh, the, the Opportunity Atlas. One is that Native kids have the lowest rates of upward mobility, even if they came from high-income families. That's this, uh, this is the one on the right, I mean, sorry, the left. This is, um, this, is the this is the slippery staircase. When we say wealthy families, it means maybe a family on the reservation where both parents have a job. 
She also found that Native women experienced the largest disparities in intergenerational mobility. And something that I'll show you a little bit later, she found this surprising finding. And that is that Native kids who are raised on or near the reservation, these are the census tracts with significant reservation overlap, will show greater upward mobility. That is where I find the hope. And I know some of these seem contradictory, um, but let me, let, me, let me process this a little bit further. Uh, the data are not perfect. There's a lot of noise, but I think we see some, uh, some strong indication of, of uh, some phenomena. So here I want to turn to violence against Native women. And this is um, something that's near uh, to almost every single family in Indian country. Uh, violence against Native women, the trafficking of Native women, missing, murdered Indigenous women movement that has come out of, I think, the VAWA efforts, violence against women. But according to our Department of Justice, four out of five Native women are impacted by violence. And this could be sexual violence, this could be physical violence, violence of some sort. We're surrounded imbued by violence. And Native women face murder rates more than 10 times the national average. The Center for Disease Control, looking at homicide, find that homicide is the third leading cause of death among Native women ages 10 to 24. That is really, really scary. The, crime, the National Crime Victimization Survey finds that Native women are more likely to sustain injuries and require medical care from an assault compared to white, African American, and Asian women. It is part of this violence that has started with the slaughter of the bison, and it, it continues today. Uh, I have a sister who is a state legislator in Minnesota who uh, carried the bill that became law um, that created a task force to study this, uh, um, the murdered, the missing Native women. And we don't even have the good data to say, are these data correct and accurate? Are they up to date? Who's responsible jurisdictionally for uh, public safety? So it's a... It's a blight. It's, 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 it's just absolutely tragic. But turning uh, the page, um, I want to talk now about self-governance and self-determination and resurgence, because the landscape of history, the landscape of opportunity, the disparities that we're finding are part of the story. The other part is a part of strength and courage and resilience and certainly persistence. We've seen how institutions and historic events and political and societal uh, events have been um, a conduit for persistent effects on the economic development of Indian country. But since the 1980s, and I think this really has come out of the, the civil rights movement, this is where we see the pan-Indian uh, coalitions forming around the National Congress for American Indians, the Native American Rights Fund, where I started my legal career, looking to enforce the treaty rights and legal obligations, the trust responsibilities of the federal government, as well as trying to figure out, OK, we got to do this for ourselves. How are we going to do that? And much of this resurgence has been attributed to, um, to leadership and, and informal leadership more than anything. So this is the same map I was showing you earlier about that HUD 184, that's uh, the loan program that's completely bypassing uh, Indian country. But I wanted to know, well, where are loans being made and how are they being made? So I plotted um, this map to show me tribes and communities that are doing well both in terms of the number of mortgages to their citizens and those that are actually getting it done on trust lands. And what we find over to the far right is that uh, the Flathead Reservation, which is home to the Confederated Salish and Kootenai tribes, are pretty amazing. 
that they have done both high number of loans and a high percentage of those loans on their trust lands. We see that the Oneida of Wisconsin are doing well. We see the Eastern Band of Cherokee. And we see a lot of other activity on the, getting the volume of loans up. To me, this shows strong leadership. And in going further, we find that that leadership is creating institutions like the Model Tribal Secure Transaction uh, Code, like tribal courts. They're establishing financial institutions, native tribal-owned banks, and native credit unions, and native CDFIs that are filling in the gaps where we see traditional lenders that have retreated from the market. They're not only bringing capital to Indian country, they're supporting financial education and credit rebuilding and just getting uh, Native people familiar with this is the system and this is how you got to work it. These are the processes that had been very foreign and um, unknown to us before. We're actually doing a, 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 a really neat research project now with the two tribes in Wisconsin. We have one tribe that owns a bank, the Oneida Nation of Wisconsin owns a bank in Green Bay, Wisconsin, it's called Bay Bank. And they want to open up a branch of that bank in another native nation's community. This community has never had a bank or financial institution. It's the only county in Wisconsin that doesn't have any sort of financial institution. So we're at the very beginning to see what is the uptake of the new community to financial services, what kind of community engagement, and, and how will these banking services be used. It actually is really quite exciting. Gaming, I'm sure that was on your mind from the very beginning. Uh, I, I was in-house counsel with, to the Mashantucket Pequot tribe uh, since the early 1990s. And the Pequot tribe um, owns Foxwoods Resort Casino in Connecticut. It was one of the first casinos uh, that had f amazing growth and, um, and, and really set I think the standard both for the style and design of casinos, but also the interactions with the state and local governments in terms of revenue sharing. So as you can see in the early 1990s, revenue was fairly low. By the way, these are in billions of dollars. And so now you see in 2017, I added on $32 billion. And a lot of this money, I would say, 97 cents on every dollar is spent off the reservation. 97 cents on the dollar is spent off the reservation. But what I wanted to, to share with you is the positive impact of Indian gaming in the increase of per capita income. And uh, there's a wonderful study by economist Randy Akee on the Eastern Band of Cherokee. And if you go back here, you see that they're uh, one of the tribes that are doing really well, both in home ownership and um, on, on their tribal lands. And Randy wanted to take a look at um, how the Eastern Band of Cherokee distributed their income through per capita payments and what would be the impact in their community, right? This was part of the, uh, these were outcomes uh, uh, that were measured from the Great Smoky Mountain Survey. Some of you may be familiar with that. And, and those research researchers looked at both um, sort of the clinically validated DSM measures for emotional and behavioral symptoms, as well as sort of other things that indicated uh, so social progress or, or decline. And the finding was this, that a family income boost of a very modest income, $4,000, resulted in significant and large improvements overall. So these are per capita payments or distribution of the gaming revenue. And for the Eastern Band, they distributed $4,000 to every family. 
and Randy found significant and large improvements. And this uh, included children's educational attainment, like graduation rates. This uh, amounted to uh, a decrease in encounters with the criminal system, like juvenile, the juvenile detention and adult criminal justice system, behavioral and emotional health, as well as, surprisingly to me, civic engagement more community members engaged in voting, engaged in committees, they participated in supporting the overall governance of the community. And we see this in these two charts. I'm hoping you can see the top is um, coefficients on American Indians by way for social behavioral disorders. And the bottom trends uh, looks at these coefficients on Native Americans by way for conscientiousness. And you see on the top graph, it goes down. The social uh, disorders are decreasing while conscientiousness is going up. And you know, these two key personality traits I find actually quite fascinating because conscientiousness is really about people um, um, who are not, who are telling the truth, who are socially engaged, they follow the rules, they pay attention. We're seeing a really positive upswing on conscientiousness, agreeableness, and the ability to socialize. It's the comfort level of being with people and around people. That's that civic engagement. And so we have to ask ourselves, how does money help? We find that money helps some of the most vulnerable people in some of the most significant ways. But how does money help, right? And who does it help? And so we, we really find that um, income intervention, especially with parents who are really struggling, can improve overall family conditions. Um, it improves um, their, their, their mood, it lowers their stress, it allows them to maybe engage in conflict with less strife. We see the income has the big, the income boost has the biggest impact on children who started off with the greatest problems. We just don't know uh, exactly the long-term impact on this, but parents have said that this extra income boost really gave them the ability to just, to just survive, not to struggle and, and not to be stressed out about how I'm going to buy diapers or fill my, uh, my car with gas or pay a cell phone bill or the utility bill. These less stressed parents made better decisions or were able to engage with their children. Yes, yes. So this is this is um, this is consistent. This is consistent additional income, sort of like the earned income tax credit that I received. And like, oh my gosh, this was uh, such a phenomenal um, program. Yes. Predicted regularly. regularly. And that you knew about it. Mm -hmm. And these were modest. Again, there are some other per capita distributions that are quite substantial and some others that are quite low. Or some tribal leaders are saying, we're not going to give per capitas. We're going to put our funds into education or child welfare, what, whatever sort of uh, computation. But it's an investment in the community. Conditional meaning the the improvements. Oh, these payments. I'm sorry. Yes, these payments were unconditional. No, and I think that's a really good question because oftentimes we think of um, income distributions requiring a work component, right? I think that's what you you might be getting at. And, and, and we find in Native communities and in the Native communities that I've worked in that the deficits are so, so deep that it's going to take a long time even to get parity uh, 
with the norm, right? Um, so these were non-conditional payments. Just one more. Yes, of course. No, no, this is a this is a conversation that we've started recently on wealth in Indian country. And I reason uh, I, I moderated a panel conversation at a, a recent conference of the uh, Native American Financial Officers Association. And we had tribal leaders of uh, from three different tribes. And uh, I wanted to know what does wealth look like to them? And one tribal community does give out very generous per capita payments. Another tribal community said we are not giving out per capita payments. And then still another tribal community said we're struggling, but we're going to acquire this land at a premium because of its cultural historical ties to one of our, our great leaders, Standing Bear. So each tribe has a, has a, has a different um, model of, of distributing capita and supporting the community. Did I answer your question? I guess I was wondering if the results look similar for the opposite. The results from this study only looked at the, um, at the income support. Okay. Yeah. But we're interested, I guess maybe that's where I was injecting myself. We're interested in looking at other models as well and the overall impacts, yeah, thank you. So remember I told you about the, that third finding uh, from our intergenerational mobility, and I said that um, uh, the kids were really, uh, the kids who grew up on or near the reservation showed the, 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 the more upward mobility. That's this chart, or this graph, Kind of the noise in the data tells us that we may not be able to rely on this. But in here we find in the fifth quintile some fairly strong correlations that these native kids are actually demonstrating more or greater upward mobility and likely to reach the top income um, distribution. So this is where I really want to examine what is going on here. Is it education? Is it having a stable home? Is it having a higher price job? What is it that's raising, uh, raising uh, the spectrum of upward mobility? It reminds me also, and mind you, these are kids that are growing up on or near the reservation, which I also would find a little incongruent because of these other factors that we had talked about. So what I think and what I'm exploring further is that maybe reservations are not the commonly charged negative predictors of economic outcomes. This is where I think we need to focus a lot of our time and attention. And going back to indigenous women and violence against women, I wanted to show you this because we are taking, uh, we are taking a close look. We are taking this into our own hands. And I think that's the real determinant of, of, of our survival is that uh, it's a ribbon skirt, and if you know Native, com Native culture, it's a form of uh, cultural and traditional clothing that represents the sacredness of the American Indian and Native, uh, um, Native women everywhere. I won't want to distinguish. Indigenous women everywhere. The deep connection we feel to our, to our bodies and to the spirits that we have this connection to our land. And so with the murdered missing indigenous women's um, task forces that are being created across uh, the country, and certainly I think on a national level, we are going to expose, we are going to shine a light on this, and we are really going to take a, a strong, take it back uh, for native women.
And I think the hardest thing for any woman who's been um, a victim of violence, and certainly sexual violence, is sharing your stories. And this is where I'm finding the strongest and the most courageous women are showing up and telling their stories of, of, of just atrocious acts committed against them, against their mothers and their grandmothers and their aunts and their daughters. So this, to me, gives us hope, but we need good data. It's a mess right now, and we see institutions are not talking to each other. We see jurisdictions not talking to each other. We can't get a grip on this until we know exactly what's going on. And I just mentioned two more things here. We did a recent study of police stops in Minneapolis. One of our research assistants uh, did a study, and they thought they were going to see a lot of encounters with, with black people, uh, with black males in particular, but what she found was that grossly disproportionately, the most significant encounters with Minneapolis police for stops of suspicious persons were Native women. And we have no idea why that would be that way. So data matters. What do the numbers mean? Are they to be trusted? Are they reliable? How do you identify as a Native woman? What does suspicious look like? I mean, these are telling us not just high mortality rates, but encounters that are um, pretty alarming. So I throw this out to the world, to all of you. How can we support indigenous economic resurgence. And um, sometimes I think of the word insurgence, you know, we need to create a, uh, we need to react, we need to respond, and we need to do it in a, in a really, really big way. I think it's a question that, re, that, that all of us are responsible for, even though we are a small part, a small percentage of the U.S. population. I want to say that we're a very significant part of our heritage, our economy. Going back to the gaming conversation, did you know that American Indian tribes are the 13th largest employer in the United States? Collectively, over 700,000 employees. And these employees have benefits. They have health benefits. They have 401k. And if you think about where Indian country is, going back to the map in rural communities, I think there's a huge opportunity uh, to, to combine Indian country resurgence and, and, and rural economic development. So certainly education, conversations like this are really important. Uh, we have to continue the research. We absolutely have to dig in and, 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 and get more data, more reliable data. Um, and the policy advocacy that all of you have in, within your powers. Um, and we need to support governance improvement. And I don't say that lightly. Uh, and, and, and it's governance on all levels, because certainly native governance needs to uh, significantly improve both the empowerment and the ability to control our destinies, our resources, going back to that buffalo, that strong buffalo uh, bison-dependent uh, reliant society, but also federal government, which is uh, just a bureaucratic mess when it comes to Native people. I said earlier that we have sovereignty over the land, over our people, but we don't have control over these processes. We've got to get some control, and we need to, as users, as end users and, and, and stakeholders, we need, to, we need to push for these reforms. And certainly the governance improvement has to come from within, but the federal government has an overarching trust responsibility that cannot be, um, that cannot be disregarded. And so I, I want to say in Lakota Pilamayaye, which means uh, thank you. And if I'd say Pilamayaye Tonka, I would say thank you very much. I appreciate your time and attention.
That's a really good question and, and something that we've been talking about lately internally, uh, reparations for American Indians. And this is in the context of a, a lot of other conversations going on uh, for reparations for African Americans, descendants of slaves, and so forth. And in the context of um, American Indians, Alaska Natives, Native Hawaiians, uh, reparations is a really important conversation. And oftentimes when we think of well, reparation for what harm, and you had started with the bison, and so that's what I was uh, connecting, the, the, connecting the dots. Reparations for American Indians and Alaska Natives, for indigenous people is, is, is really wound up in this political history because there has been uh, the takings of the land, the taking of sort of the identity, the, the boarding schools, the taking of the economy and, and the subsistence. What we have found, and, and this is really, um, I think, remarkable, is that um, the work of American Indians through the legal system, especially, um, as I was saying earlier, the, the Native American Rights Fund uh, started in the early 70s coming out of the civil rights movement uh, to try to enforce those, um, those treaties as the highest law of the land. These are legal obligations. And, um, and that was firmly establishing the different rights, legal rights, one to exist, one to have standing in the court, and when to actually get compensation for that loss. So for example, the, the uh, US Supreme Court has said that the United States can take any land it wants from an American Indian Native American community. The condition though is that it has to pay for those lands. It has to give due compensation or just compensation. So usually you don't have the right to take anybody's land. Uh, but uh, the federal government through the Supreme Court has that right. Uh, and, and this is a real life issue per currently um, unsolvable in that um, the United States took the Black Hills. You know, I showed you the map of Indian country of the Great Sioux Nation. And one of the reasons why they wanted all that land is because there was gold in the Black Hills, Pahasapa. And, and Pahasapa is a very sacred place to us. And uh, the case went all the way to the Supreme Court and the, found that, yes, the government has this right to take the lands. It has to compensate. Well. I think $8 billion was put aside uh, to compensate the Sioux Nation for these lands. And this was back in the, I'm not sure, the 70s, for example. The Native peoples have said, we don't want that money. We do not want that money. We want our land. And not only do we not want the land and not for the resources to exploit, but it's a sacred place for us. And, and so reparations for Native American people, for indigenous people, means a lot of different things. We would like to, for example, stop the, the, the denigrating mascots. You know, that would be a really big step forward. Is that a reparation? Well, maybe stopping an injury feels like it would be, but is there compensation involved? Not necessarily. It's, it's an acknowledgement or a recognition that these are harmful uh, activities and they continue to be harmful. Um, on reparations that have financial you know, compensation, uh, many tribes have been keeping, uh, have been persisting in, in trying to enforce the trust responsibility against the federal government. So you may have heard about the Cobell land claim, Eloise Cobell, and, and this is just a short story. I was a, a new attorney at the Native American Rights Fund when the board of directors uh, was considering the question of whether or not we should file claim against the federal government for mismanagement of the trust resources. And the trust resources are generally any funds that are derived from the trust lands, from the reservations. And that could be leasing for grazing and ranching purposes. It could be extracting minerals. It could be any use for which <clears throat> uh, income is derived. 
And all of those are put into a trust account. My mother had what they called an IIM account, an individual Indian money account. And lot and lands would be leased out, and those monies would be collected, and then a check would be uh, sent to my mother. And we always looked forward to those checks around school time for new shoes or Christmas time, or sometimes it was a turkey for Thanksgiving. Um, but those monies had been grossly and 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 consistently mismanaged, and and billions and billions of dollars lost. So the board of directors uh, hired consultants through um, the big audit firms, Arthur Anderson and such. And all of these big audit firms said, don't do this. It's just a mess. There's no accounting possible of all of the loss, either of all the accounts or the loss of the land, or of the funds, and so forth. Well, the board of directors said, we have to do this. This is much a legal imperative, as it, a moral imperative, as it is a legal imperative. So fast forward almost 25 years later, and I find myself in this solicitor's office at the Department of the Interior, and we're finally settling those Cobell claims. And the sad thing is, is the good thing is that the claims were settled once and for all. The sad thing and the controversial thing continues to be that they were settled on pennies on the dollar. So you had the gross mismanagement with an enormous loss, and then you have further and further cuts. So when we try to quantify what that loss looks like, it's so complicated and Sometimes it's not about the money. It's about uh, finding the, the, moral, um, the moral right. Yeah. And so reparations in the American Indian community looks very different, but it is part of the conversation, especially as we see um, urban Indians being treated very, very, very differently and uh, sub substandardly. Yes, sir. <laughs> Yes, yes, yes. Yes. Yes, yes, yes. Fantastic question. <clears throat> and, and that's why we have a mother and a child, because I think all of our hope is for the next generation, for the children. And the first convening that we had, that I uh, said we were going to start our work around, was early childhood development in Indian country. And this is another story that sort of illustrates these institutional, I don't know, angst around Native issues. Um, so I wanted to, I wanted early childhood because the focus has got to be on the children. And I wanted it to be, I wanted to start with uh, trauma, historical trauma. You know, the boarding school and the Indian child removal and, and all of this. And uh, my colleagues at the time were saying, oh, that's, that, that just feels really uncomfortable, that we would talk about trauma. And I, and I said, well, what? where would we start? They said, well, let's talk about brain development, and sort of the science of brain development. And I said, we don't get to brain development until we talk about trauma. And I said, and we have Native American scholars, my cousin, Josie Gates, and Dr. Maria Yellowhorse Braveheart, who are phenomenal scholars on historical trauma. I said, we have to start with trauma, then we can talk about brain science and how that impacts um, uh, early childhood development. And then I said, uh, this is continuing the story, I said, and we're going to start with a drum. And they said, a drum? 
a, a drum in the, in, well, it'll be so noisy, we'll disturb people. I said, well, great, let's make some noise, let's disturb people. And I said, and then we're going to have a prayer. We always start out uh, with a prayer. And like, oh, we don't pray here. You know, we're non-secular. I said, in the Indian way, we, this is the way we start. So I, I think these are institutional ways to, 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 to understand uh, not just culture, but the approach to the work. Um, so yes, I'd like to show you something on here. We then created a wonderful collaboration with uh, the uh, Casey Family Programs and uh, a local tribe, the Shakopee Midwakantan Sioux Tribe, around healthy children, healthy nations. And we really looked at, um, at who, uh, how many, how many programs, what sort of the composition of the programs, how do we define teachers, because we have a lot of traditional teachers. We find that language is probably one of the most important factors for children's later uh, uh, development. And the way we, we look at that is in the sense of um, learning Another language is about, especially Indian language, it's very cultural. It's very, very um, based on, 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 on identity. So we believe that language and quality education combined provides the best opportunity for resilience in later life. And we do have some studies on that. That's a great, great question, thanks. Yes. And they were talking about the murder of women and the church and all of these things. Mm -hmm. And they were saying that one of the key issues is that when there is a murder, the question of the jurisdiction of whether the perpetrator is a Native American or not, or whether they are Native American or not, all of these things play. Um, and so once the, the, the tribal uh, institutions or courts decide to actually collaborate with the jurisdiction, that also Mm -hmm. Right, right. So how are those institutions affected, or what role do you think the teachers play that? And what have there been some gains, some discoveries as the institutions have been working with the tribes that have been forward, mm -hmm. or is it just a slow transition to describe the process yeah. to the Indian level of right, right. So distrust is sort of this big umbrella. That, uh, that holds a lot of institutional angst. And again, it, it, I, I, I trace it back in terms of history and, and then the reaction to history. So in the boarding school era, the way kids were rounded up is um, they either would come to the door and say, I'm taking your child, we're going to educate your child, but they never said, and you'll never see your child again for seven years. One day your child was, was just gone. Or they'd come, uh, the BI agent would come and say, we're taking all your kids to the dentist. Uh, it's a health checkup. And the bus would never return, and the kids would be sent off to boarding schools. Or um, it would be, as you had mentioned, who's going to protect me, right? And uh, if you're a Native person on a reservation, it's generally the tribe and the federal government that are responsible for public safety. And the federal government has jurisdiction over major crimes. The tribe has jurisdiction over everything else. But if you're on the uh, Pine Ridge Reservation or the Navajo Reservation, as you saw that vast territory, 
what is the responsiveness of that FBI agent to a missing woman call or a murder? Um, there was a, um, a really uh, amazing film uh, this past year or so called Wind River. You may have seen it. And, and, and that is, uh, Wind River is a reservation in Wyoming. And it's home to two reservations. But it, it really showed the, the, the mess, the complexity of who's in charge, are they responsive or not? And will there ever be an investigation? Will there ever be a prosecution? Will there ever be uh, a sentencing? And so it starts from this very beginning of distrust, as you said, because we think the, the incidents of violence are enormously underreported. And then who do you send that report? To? Who do you call, right? Do you call the tribe? Do you call the county? Do you call the state? Do you call the FBI? It isn't clear. And, um, and, and, and even tribes that have uh, law enforcement agreements with state and local or, um, or the FBI, there just isn't the resources to pursue investigation of every incident. Several years back, the Department of Justice actually funded a surge of law enforcement activities at the Standing Rock Reservation, which I really was keenly interested given my, my family connections there. And they found that indeed with additional law enforcement, crimes were reduced um, substantially, the incidents of crimes, and those that had been committed that were investigated actually were prosecuted, and that itself was a deterrent to crime. So the importance of having a law enforcement presence cannot be understated. Um, and then, but trust permeates, distrust permeates every institution, from education to healthcare um, to law enforcement. Okay, so I have a mouse here, and this uh, this is our home page. I just want to show you we have a, a resources button up here. Huh? I'm not going to be able to get it. Huh? And then uh, all of our events and I and and speeches, which I think are really uh, valuable content in themselves, just because a lot of the powerpoints and materials are there. Oh, okay, sure. Open up resources. Well, I'm just going to scroll down here, if you don't mind. So one of the big things we've been focusing on is uh, home ownership. And I, I showed you a little bit this morning. This button, it's, this tab itself is um, a handbook that, that collectively the Native, the National Native American Home Ownership Coalition that I established created this handbook. And it really is to unravel this very complicated mortgage lending system. It's pretty fantastic. It's chock full of research and resources in itself, case studies. Again, it was a collaborative uh, undertaking. And here it is. Um, we really wrote it for uh, tribal leaders because they themselves said, we don't understand home ownership. Please help us understand how this works. What we find, though, is that banks and lenders and federal agencies really love this resource because it shows, uh, uh, let me go see if I can get into it. This is the PDF version, but it, um, it shows um, how we do home ownership. We have case studies, for example, a large tribal subdivision in New Mexico. We talk about Alaska. We talk about the partners that are needed to support home ownership, especially, as we said, credit building and repairing credit scores, becoming home buyer uh, ready. We need to understand the community needs. And here I want to tell you about an amazing uh, leader in the community, Sharon Vogel, on the Cheyenne Sioux Reservation in South Dakota. She's creating, she's building 400 units on the reservation. And it's taken her at least 10 years to come to this point where she's actually um, helping people move into their homes. Uh, this is a this is a study, and I think there's a um, 
a video. This is the Salish and Kootenai uh, tribe that I was telling you about on the Flathead Reservation in Montana. We wanted to know why and how they were creating home ownership opportunities. And uh, it, it comes down to not one guy, but one guy named Jason Adams, who assembled a team and connected to the, the bank and said, we're all going to do this together. And all of the tribal leadership said, home ownership is a priority, and we're going to go through the program itself. So we really took a look at the lending processes, um, and this became really the subject of our testimony, my testimony before the, the US Senate. Um, one thing I wanted to show you is our work on manufactured housing. So Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac have a duty to serve obligation, and it includes American Indians, rural, and manufactured housing. Once we took a look at the HMDA data, the Home Mortgage Disclosure Act data, we found just uh, so many remarkable findings, you know, one of which was this enormous concentration of lenders, uh, two lenders particularly, um, that are accountable for these high cost loans in Indian country. So there's a concentration of market, there's this enormously high price of lending, and uh, we've done some subsequent work on manufactured housing. So getting back, see if I can do this. Okay. Um, let's let me show you the resources page. There we go. It doesn't look very pretty, but I, I want to show you that um, we've got mapping native financial institutions. We have reservation profiles. So for any reservation over 2,500 or is it 1,500, you can get in and look at the demographics. But we also loaded it with uh, housing. Humda data and broadband data. Broadband has become enormously important, not just for economic development, but for uh, telemedicine and distance learning. So what I want to show you, because this is super fun, at least for me, is our mapping of Native American institutions. Hmm, where is it? Right here. Right there. I call these, I've designated this term NAFIs, uh, Native American Financial Institutions. I wanted to know who was serving Indian country, right? All right, I need some help in this, clear, this mouse. <laughs> so when we saw that there was a huge retreat post-recession of conventional lenders from Indian country, I really wanted to make a... Uh, uh, I wanted to know who is serving Indian country, and what I found was absolutely revealing. And so I said, okay, let's put this on a map and really take a good look at it. So I'm calling uh, the collection of banks, native-owned banks, uh, native-owned um, credit unions, and CDFI funds as NAFIs now, Native American Financial Institutions. And I wanted to know where they were located. I wanted to know their size in terms of assets and liabilities. I wanted to see if they're combined, CDFI funds along with banks. So here, this big, and so as you hover over each one, this is F&M Bank, it's in Oklahoma. It's one of the biggest banks that there is. And Oklahoma, as we mentioned earlier, does not have a lot of trust land. So it's a whole lot easier to lend, both commercially, residentially, and of course, um, for economic development with, the, with the, uh, the tribe. Here, this is the Tigua Community Development Corporation. It's very, very tiny. But even that it exists is sort of a, a, a really remarkable marker as well. I wanted to point out, uh, this is the Cook Inlet Lending uh, Center. It's a CDFI fund. And again, it has, um, uh, it has a big footprint. You can see by the size of the circle, it's a really big, imp uh, big um, footprint and a big impact. This is Tongas Federal Credit Union. And Tongas is not necessarily a native-owned credit union, 
but it serves the native population in such innovative ways. They have micro centers dotted along their territory, and they're doing that you know, to a cost to support the, um, the community needs. Okay, um, this big giant um, purple dot in Oak, uh, Colorado is the Native American bank. Tribes 20 years ago got together, 30 years ago, and said, we need a bank that provides us our own capital for the big lending deals, for casinos, or what have you. And then, um, I love this one, the Lakota Federal Credit Union. It's on the Pine Ridge Reservation. And one of the hardest places to get any traction is Pine Ridge. Well, Lakota Brunch, or Tawny Brunch, I should say, at Lakota Funds is just doing phenomenal work. She has Lakota Funds and she has a credit union. And she's making loans to veterans. She is turning around um, light tech properties into home ownership. She is absolutely awesome. And then over here, uh, this big blue dot, as I mentioned, um, where's the um, Salish and Kootenai? Eagle Bank. That's the, that's the flathead reservation I was showing you. So there's a lot of information you can get, both uh, you know, on the particular institution, but you can go down here and get a whole lot more in terms of the asset and liability statement. And we're updating this every year to really show where there's strength and where there's synergy. And, and we know that tribes want to make a deal. We've got Bay Bank over here in Wisconsin, as I was telling you earlier, um, that's going to be opening up a, a, um, a branch on another reservation. So that is enormously exciting. So the, uh, the NAFIs. So you can look and see we have about our data, what it includes. Um, I was recently at the um, um, uh, CDFI fund as well as the NCUA. And all of them are really super excited about the possibility of growing our NAFI footprint. So let's go to the uh, reservation profiles. And this was created by my colleague, uh, Dick Todd. And we wanted to explore, again, um, in a big way, the economic indicators of the reservations. And so you can, again, we wanted to put all the data out there for folks to take a look at, find a reservation. So let's see if I can do this. And let's look at the Hopi Reservation. So as we scroll down, we can see uh, groups by population. Uh, this is um, American Indians and Alaska Native alone, and then in combination. Uh, these are U.S. Census terms, obviously. And we see that it's a very uh, large community, over 9,000, of which um, the median age is, a, again, a very uh, young population, I believe. And then uh, what I like to see here is this demographic um, pyramid. Because when tribes are trying to figure out where to allocate funds and they need to uh, understand where the, the demands or the needs are, right? I look at the dem demographics, excuse me, and I see, for example, a very strong young population that tells me invest in children, invest in job force training, that invest in housing for those communities. We can look at education attainment, and here's the broadband. And something about broadband, it says here in Hopi, if you can see this, can't see this in the back, it says that uh, about 29% of households on the Hopi reservation have broadband. You know, there are two different ways of understanding broadband. One is if it's available to you. I think that might be the FCC way of looking at it. The other is if you have the ability to actually hook up to it. And that, I think, is the most important indicator because it tells you you have enough money to actually get onto the system. 
So this is a very, very low number. Apparently, the United States were well over 78%. Uh, Reservation-wise, it's only about 58% of reservations that have access to broadband. So remember I told you earlier that Hopi was a nation within a nation. It's completely within the, the Navajo reservation. So there's an, there's an infrastructure need for, for sure. We, mm-hmm. yeah, sorry, are you getting the like, Yeah, some of these are, say again. We're getting a lot of different information that we've amalgamated here. Yeah, so it is by household, and um, it is ACS, American Community Survey, and we're breaking it down, but we're also layering on other information, you know, um, like the broadband, like the Humda data, and so forth. So I was going to show just an example of, this is uh, something that my my colleague Dick Todd has really studied is where do we find income by source? And we find in Indian country, uh, a good part of it is uh, self-employed, well, this doesn't show it much. Uh, This is wages and salary. Here's the United States, here's uh, th- this particular community, the Hopi community. This is self-employment, this is interest and dividends, social security. You can see um, public assistance. And we're trying to map this to the relative to the, to, the, um, uh, to the United States. The type of income, I wish to say. Self-employment tends to be high. We look at poverty rates, we look at home ownership. This is really remarkable, and this is what I wanted to show you, is it shows, suggests that there's like a 73% home ownership rate on the Hopi Reservation. Now, home ownership might mean something different to a Hopi than to you and I. This home or this Hogan may have been inherited from many generations. They would consider that home ownership, whereas you and I might consider home ownership uh, something acquired through a mortgage. So this is remarkably high, and I, I think it's an indication of sort of the, the particular aspects of that community. And uh, here, this is what I wanted to show you. Uh, something we, we just added last year were the home loans uh, through the HOMDA, uh, the public reporting. And these are sort of the census tracts. We try to figure out the census tracts and the reservation boundaries and then to take a closer look in terms of where there was lending, right? And what we find here is that there isn't any lending. (laughs) Yeah. Right, 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 right. And then when we do look at, and and this is where some of the manufactured housing comes into place, is what kind of uh, loans are they going for? What's the denial rate? So this, I think, is uh, really useful. We're going to expand the, um, uh, the number of uh, reservations that are part of this uh, to smaller population sizes. It takes more, more time, obviously, uh, to get all that granular data. I wanted to show you, um, you had mentioned the uh, Model Tribal Secure Transaction Act. So. Um, This isn't really fun or exciting, but we do have a substantial amount of information about this model of a Secure Transaction Act. We were actually part of revising the Model Tribal Secure Transaction Act um, last year. So all of that and the implementation guide are here. Uh, And we've been trying to study, along with the Native Nations Institute, the uptake of a Secure Transaction Act. And that's very, very hard to find. Um, uh, But this should give uh, some good information. Uh, Over here, how much time do we have? I don't want to take up too much of your time, more of your time. Um, We have quite a bit of working, quite a few working papers. And so this is where I wanted to show you, many of you are researchers, you're you're policy wonks. 
um, the higher price of mortgages. Uh, we would talk about the boarding schools or the residential schools. We're looking at the value of Humda coverage. I, I wanted to um, talk about children. You know, you mentioned that earlier. This is where we're finding uh, a lot. Well, this is where we're putting a lot of our resources, our research resources. So Donna, here's this, the slaughter of the bison paper, and she's actually making all this data available. Really hoping that there'll be further contributions to this to this work. Um, I didn't mention much about our work on education, but higher education has also been a big part of our, of our work. And we find in, uh, from our research that Native Americans have started to attain levels of higher education. Um, those that actually get through are, 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 are successful. However, we also find that those uh, Native Americans who've gained either uh, grad, um, they've graduated with a, a BA or even a professional degree are not being paid at the same level. And, and, and we don't quite know why that is, but there is a huge um, uh, salary gap between, um, between that. So I would uh, really encourage you to take a look um, at your leisure, of course. Reservation employer establishments, I think, is interesting because it looks, obviously, at the impact of gaming. And it finds that there's um, a huge concentration of jobs in two sectors of the uh, workforce on, on reservations. And that would be the, uh, is it uh, recreation and entertainment sector? and the government administration sector. And that really cries out for a need to diversify, especially as we see online gaming or sports betting gaming, a downtick in, in the gaming industry will certainly have impacts. So these are the different ways that you can look at this material and, 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 and use it. Um, and then lastly, I did want to show you um, I don't think it's going to be here. Gosh, uh, we have our Healthy Children, Healthy Nations convening. That was the early child. I mean, we had early childhood convening, and um, just a, a a lot of really good resources that supports these different convenings. So this would be early learning, this would be our financial institutions and where we had broad participation around the, the mortgage lending or I mean I should say the banking industry. This is the launch of our of our book and um, and some other resources. This I, I really think is quite fantastic because it was the first time, as I said, coming together on a national level and, and really taking a look at the, you know, the, uh, the historical trauma. So that's, um, uh, that's a lot of what we have here and um, a lot of materials just completely devoted to, to home ownership. And we've tried to make it accessible with data, with our federal programs. Um, you can start at different places into, into the conversation. Yes. Yeah, uh, and, and that's a really politically sensitive topic oftentimes because if you're a tribe, you know you're a tribe, you're a tribal nation, you don't have to prove it. But in the federal way, you do have to prove it. And there's a, a Bureau of um, Acknowledgement at the Bureau of Indian Affairs that has hired many, many anthropologists and they have an elaborate um, application process, if you will, that has to show continuous existence and continuous form of governance from pre-contact. And many of these uh, 
um, proof, if you will, are, are not readily available in any real tangible uh, historical record. And sometimes that can be used against you, especially for tribes in the East that had um, relationships with colonial governments that then, of course, did a, you know, went away when you, the new federal government became, um, and that was the Mashantucket Pequot tribe in, in eastern uh, Connecticut. So the eastern Pequots were recognized not through the federal acknowledgement process, but through a land claim settlement act. You'll often hear that, um, uh, that term or that phrase is that um, lands were taken, they were disputed, there was no compensation. So uh, tribes in, in the last couple decades have come back and said, these are our lands. And you mentioned reparations. This is another way that, that tribes are trying to seek for themselves reparations. So in the process of settling that land claim, the Mashantucket Pequot tribe was recognized. Otherwise, uh, the process for acknowledgement takes a lifetime in many respects. Um, we now have 573 federally recognized tribes, and seven of which were just recognized last year. These are seven tribes from Virginia that have existed for, uh, as we say, time immemorial, but now just recently got that special designation. And it's not special in, in that sense. It's, it's what they are and have been. Um, but it's extremely time consuming, very, very costly. And the percentage of, of, of tribal nations that are actually recognized are very low. So, and, it, and you've got this procedure, administrative process built into it. So it can be um, a very, very long process. Yep, yep. But state recognized tribes like the Lumbee actually have su substantial um, benefits from, from that relationship as well. <laughs> 